I'm going to jump straight in and just give you a quick heads up on how we're going to structure the next hour and 15 minutes. So I want to talk very briefly, not in any great detail, just a little bit about um, where how we've come to this point today and how we've got the stage where we're here showing you this uh, stakeholder map that we have in place, how we got there. So um, then I'm going to jump into showing you the um, our our map as it is today and how it is evolving. And our map, as has been explained, is really um, there to give us a visualization of the breadth and the depth of the network as it is today and, and give us some insights on where we can go in terms of building an impact network. Um, and then we're going to spend a good half an hour talking to we've some uh, three really good panelists for you today. And we're going to spend some time talking to them about the successes, the challenges they, that they, we've two external networks and one network um, which is internal, a, a DOCUS member. We're going to spend some time talking about them. And that session is going to be uh, moderated by Fergal O'Connell from the, many of you will know the CEO of, of Self Help Africa. And then we're going to come back and open up the floor, uh, open up to the floor for um, a Q&A session. And, and not just Q&As, but a, a general discussion about now that we have uh, some of this conversation going and we have this tool at our disposal. Uh, where do we go from here? Um, where do we get to where we want to be? How do we work on building connections and, and deepening collaboration? And building also on uh, the successes that we've had to date, which is also really important to say, because obviously there's, there have been uh, a big number of them. So to get there, I'm just going to give you a brief look at um, the timeline of this network process. Um, in 2021, if anybody can remember back to that crazy mid-pandemic time uh, where everything happened online, we, uh, DOCUS, um, commissioned RIOS consultants to run a research project which was about reimagining the future. So it's about looking at the sector and saying, okay, well, what would um, a transformed, successful, impact, high-impact sector look like in the year 2031? Um, so it brought, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, but it brought a number of um, people across the sector and some external stakeholders together to look at reimagining the future. Um, and the reason that that piece of work was done was it was it was created to inform the strategy that we now have in place. So we're now um, into year two of the 2022 to 2026 strategy. And uh, so we, it was felt that you need, we need to do that external piece of work to inform um, where we would go in terms of that four-year strategy. Uh, that four-year strategy is made up of four main pillars. And one of, the, one of those pillars is this uh, building an impact network. So uh, roll on to the end of, uh, the end of or mid-2022 and uh, DOCUS, introduced this idea of each member organization appointing a network delegate. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, towards the end of 2022, we carried out a survey and that survey was done in two parts, part A, part B, and maybe some of you here in the room today will have been responsible for filling out that survey. But it was the second part of the survey that informed the map that I'm going to um, show you now just in a few minutes. Um, and so that has brought us to where we are today, where we have this uh, this tool in place, or certainly the beginning of this tool, that we're looking at new ways of working, that we're exploring different ways on how we can build um, greater impact and uh, deeper collaboration going forward. So just to take you back a moment to what we were talking about, the RIOS project, um, and I'm sorry that the, the screen is a little bit shaky, um, but just bear with us on that one. Um, so that RIOS project was about reimagining, as I said, reimagining the role of Irish NGOs and what it might look like in, in the year 2031. So a little bit about what, first of all, what, what were you asked? And I, I would imagine that some people in the room also took part in, in that piece of research. Sure. Um, I've mentioned the first question there, what, what features would, the, would a transform system have? Um, but we also tried to probe a little bit in, in the course of that research, the key trends and forces influencing the direction of the sector and where we would like to be. 
uh, and also trying to get behind what are some of the major obstacles to getting to that point. And so the research looked at this type of um, stop, start, continue um, style. What are the things that we need to, that we currently do well and that we need to do more of and build on? What are the things that we should stop doing? And what are the things that we really need to start to get to where we want to be? So just to say, um, overall, there are a number of themes that you, um, as, as members, came back and pointed out as part of that research. But one of the overall themes, one of the strongest themes, obviously, was everybody recognising that it's very much a changing landscape, uh, both on a local level in Ireland and at a global level, and for many reasons, both within the sector and also across um, external sector, be it business, uh, public sector, and, and all CSOs. So this is just to illustrate, this is a direct quote that um, was, was shared with us during the research. This particular individual said, well, the world is changing around us as the NGOs around us as a sector, and NGOs have really been overtaken by events. So we as NGOs are, are, are not currently or no longer um, the leaders. So just to, to set the scene of some of the things that were, were said. What else was said? Um, there was a lot said around the topic of innovation. I hope some of you can um, see what's written up here on the screen. But in terms of innovation, one of the, com one of the comments was, we've been doing this, this work for a long time. Uh, sometimes it's like pushing the same stone up the same hill, a fist of a stone. And maybe by taking part in this process, we can think about doing things a little bit differently, um, going sideways, doing things a little bit differently. What else? Comments about uh, there being a lack of diversity in the sector and that uh, resulting in this form of groupthink, which is 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 hampering innovation in many ways. Um, a little bit more in 2031, one of the comments was that the sector, we would hope that the sector might look less insecure, that it would be more outward looking, obviously there'd be more innovation and certainly more diversity, for example, in terms of partnerships, that so that would be very important. Uh, another another element that was brought out there was that um, with obviously rapidly changing technology and dissemination of information and the way that we can share information, uh, hybrid meetings, etc., that uh, that would allow for more engagement across uh, within the sector from north to south and 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 vice versa, and it would allow for more involvement of NGO. Um, leadership from people based in and from the global south and how important that was. And obviously in our second session this afternoon, we will be talking more about equitable partnerships and we'll, we'll expand on that theme. What else was said a little bit, uh, well, a lot about more the need for more collaboration. Uh, I won't go through these one by one, but overall, a lot about how we need a more holistic approach to collaboration that we need um, more in terms of strategic partnerships, both within the sector and with other sectors, um, recognizing, for example, that uh, currently, while we're, as, a, as members, we're all focused on different thematics and different things, but it's very, really, we need to emphasize and, and build on the fact that there are very strong links between the different objectives. A small pool of committed people, but that there's a need for a multi-stakeholder future, which means collaboration, collaboration um, not with just those that we are collaborating with now, um, but again, with, with uh, perhaps outside the sector or outside of the usual subjects. And one, uh, one comment even went, as, I was going to say, as far as to say that maybe in 2031, we would completely gotten rid of the, the um, divide or the, the divide really between humanitarian and development, the distinction and that instead of, looking at things in that way, we'll be looking more around um, core issues and the issues that were brought up there around governance, uh, particularly governance and, and protection. So a little bit quickly about the network delegates role. Uh, in the summer of 2022, each member was asked to appoint a, a network delegate. Um, the first network delegates meeting took place last summer summer of 2022, and our second network del delegates meeting took place just uh, in March there, about a month ago. And what's the role of the network delegate? Well, firstly, uh, and, and importantly, that that individual would very much take a view across their organization. So it wouldn't be about one particular uh, function, be it communications or fundraising or dev or whatever it might be, that it would be across the organization and that they would bring that view 
to be the focal point for that member's engagement with uh, with the DOCA secretariat, but also with directly with other um, DOCA's uh, network, uh, other DOCA's members. And ultimately, that that individual would support the development of communications tools and help us uh, within the sector and the secretariat to, to bring this whole process forward. So that is uh, very much work in progress. Many members have nominated network delegates, but perhaps not everybody has, uh, but we, we will be working on that going forward. So we got to the stage where we uh, decided to choose this uh, stakeholder mapping tool that I'm about to show you. Um, why did we do that? Well, we looked at uh, networks inter internationally. Uh, we looked at best practice in how networks are developed, um, some of the more successful ones. And we found that some of them were using um, particularly this process of stakeholder mapping along with other tools. But what we hope that the tool might, a few of the things that the tool will do will certainly be to, to clarify what we have um, currently, what our thinking is currently, but also to make sure that we are, that, that, that we are, di that we're dynamic in our, and agile in our thinking. We're hoping that it will spark thinking on further collaborations, on how we can improve systems, also to help us uh, visualize any blocks in, in getting to where we want to be, but and also to identify both gaps and opportunities for how we might get there. So very, on the last slide before I, I show you the map, uh, these are a list of questions that we sent out to you as part of that survey that I, I mentioned. I won't go through them all now because you, you'll see them coming out uh, in, in the maps themselves. So if you just bear with me a moment, I need to switch into the DOCUS mapping software itself. So let's just hope this works. Okay. Okay. Right, so first up, and I apologize, I'll need to stand here to um, control it. This is a visualization of our sector as it is today. So this first map is um, organization to organization connections. So, so, so it's in response to the question that we asked you, which was, which me DOCA's members do you most regularly communicate with? Um, I'll give you just a larger view of that. So that is the map in, in its base view. That's all the data in one place. What you can then do is uh, focus in on particular areas. Um, in this case, World Vision. This is showing World Vision and all how it is connected to other member organizations within the network. If you click and hold on each circle, and a cir every circle obviously represents a, a member, it, it brings up a full um, profile of that particular organization, uh, which is basically a summary of all the data that, that you would have given us as part of, and, and more as part of that survey. Uh, what you can also do is, uh, well, similar to what I showed you with World Vision, you can, you can isolate each organization and see which, uh, which other members it's directly connected to. This is the donor organization map. So it shows you from which donors each organization is receiving funding. If I click on from there, this is an example in this case of um, which organizations have identified, have, have identified themselves as receiving funds from ECHO. So that is a, a focused view of the donor map. We also uh, created a map based on what organiza organizations uh, identified as their areas of expertise or the particular thematics that they focus on. And that is uh, a view of it there. Um, apologies that you can't see it in greater detail. But what I would say to you is that in, in the break, we're going to have a couple of laptops around the room. And so anybody who would like to can maybe go and have a, a, a more upfront uh, a, a closer uh, little demo of finding your way around the map and there'll be somebody uh, at each station to help you do that. Um, and I have to say, obviously, this is a, a whistle-stop tour and at, at, at other stages, we'll be helping you to look at this in, in more detail. Um, again, if you look at, uh, you can look at it from a different perspective. If you look, in this case, Action Aid has identified itself as 
um, have it, focusing on these particular thematics. If you look at it from in the converse, from a different perspective, you can see that you can hone in on each particular thematic and see which organization has identified itself as uh, specializing or being involved in that area. Moving on from that, we also have a map which uh, visualizes or puts it together a visualization of each organization's current advocacy priorities or the ones that they have identified. I should say up front, um, and we, we've had some discussion about this in the network delegate meeting, that you know the the data is not perfect, and the data is always going to be evolving. So this uh, this data was given at a particular point in time. Um, it will never be fully up to date, but it still gives us uh, a, a lot to work with. And we're looking at, uh, of course, we're looking at a process of how we would we would keep it more alive at, at different uh, at different points or update it at different points. If you on this advocacy map, if you focus in on a particular uh, theme, in this case, climate finance, this gives you a view of the organizations that have identified climate finance as one of their areas of, well, one of their priorities in relation to advocacy. Moving on from that, we also have uh, this map, which is called uh, the sectoral practices map. It's the base view of that, so all the data um, in it. And the main parts of this will be things like locally-led development, which we'll talk about later, safeguarding, charity regulations, ethical communications, et cetera. Um, similar to the other maps, you can focus in on one area of sectoral practices. In this case, I'm, I'm looking at um, a subsector of locally-led development, which is visibility and sharing. And these are the organizations that has associated itself with that element. We have a map based on what you as members have identified as your shared learning priorities. Um, there are a lot of different shared learning priorities in there. Uh, we have a map which gives you an overview of international alliances that our members have. Uh, and we have something very similar for uh, the what you have identified as your um, national alliances. So apologies that I thought that is a, a very much a whistle-stop tour of what we have. Um, obviously, we, we'd like the opportunity to work with you to look at it in, in more detail and to see what you would find useful out of it and what you would find useful to build on in terms of de developing the tool. Um, so I am going to quickly jump back into one more slide that I would like to share with you, which is about essentially but what we see as the potential uses for, I've mentioned some of them, but the potential uses for this particular tool. And of course, as technology would have it, it doesn't want to display, but I can tell you, I can tell you what they are. There are only six of them. Um, First of all, we, we would see it as, um, well, there are a number of things that, that were discussed at the, particularly in the, the network development uh, meeting. Oh, what, sorry, just to go back a second. Uh, what, what is showing here is um, the fact that what we are also currently working on is trying to put together a map of um, each member's what countries they're in and their their country programs and that was something that um, came up again with the network delegates and it was felt that uh, that would be very useful to members or was identified as something that would be very useful so we are working we're working on that at the moment we're working off data the last time it was updated was in 2021 but that's just a start and, and we can look at it again and how, how we uh, take it into 2023 and what what you're doing so quickly to the um, potential uses of this tool, six main uses, uh, obviously for sectoral planning and analysis. So planning and analysis across the sector, across all the different members. But we also think it could be something that would be very useful for each individual member to use in terms of their own strategic and possibly even uh, thematic and program planning. Um, it can certainly be used in a number of different ways for looking at campaigns, campaign mobilization, 
that was again something that was was felt would be particularly uh, the network delegates that we spoke to felt that would be very it would be very valuable for that. Uh, it can be used for purposes of PR, fundraising, marketing. It's a great snapshot, vis a visual tool to use um, when going out there talking about the sector. It can be used for monitoring and evaluation, and it could also be used internally for new employees to the sector. So I think it would be uh, great to, to use as an induction tool, and uh, there's a wealth of information there to share with, with new employees. So what I would like to do now is to, we have a Mentimeter going. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask you to uh, rank in terms of from one to six, very simple exercise, um, how you, which you would see as the most Im important and valuable ways to use this particular tool. Just as a starting point for this conversation, we're gonna do that. Um, and then I am going to hand you over to Fergal to start uh, talking to, to invite our panelists up and to open that, the second part of this, of this discussion. Say again? Just call out for the code at the top. Some people might be able to see. Okay, I don't know if everybody can see the code at the top of that slide. So maybe some of you are, are familiar with this using Menti, but not everybody. So if you just maybe use your phones, those of you who can, to go into menti.com. And from there, it'll request a code. And that is the code at the top. So it's, I can pull it out again in a minute when, if any of you manage to get into menti.com. It is 799-2341. Okay, that's quick. So it seems that the rankings are, oh, okay, no, it's still, it's still a work in progress. I was gonna say sectoral analysis and planning, but it looks like the first up ranking is Yes, sectoral analysis and planning. And then lower down in the list would be induction for new employees. And interestingly, at the bottom of the list would be PR and marketing. Okay, that's 34, 36. Yeah, so okay, still working. Okay, I'll leave it open for a couple of minutes before I hand you over to Fergal. Before I hand you over, is there, we are, as I said, we are going to come back to a general Q&A where we can have, we can, we can discuss in more detail this tool um, and you can ask any particular questions you would like to then. So I actually, I think in the interest of time, we'll leave it until, we'll leave it until we come back to the floor to ask those questions because of course I have run over a little bit and we'd like to get on with our panel discussion and we can always come back to the results of this survey. Virgil, shall I hand over to Thank you? you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Gillian. That's that's amazing. Uh, now, this is going to be a, a bit like the price is right. I kind of feel like I'm going to invite the panellists to come down. I'm really dating myself by referencing the price is right. I realise that. And you have to come down, be, like very excited people who are going to win contestants. So we have uh, we have Martina Fitzgerald, Emmeline uh, Spallen and Frank Geary. Uh, Martina is the CEO of uh, Scale Ireland, uh, which is a non-profit uh, which supports, uh, rep represents and advocates on behalf of uh, the Irish tech startup sector and scale-up companies. Uh, Emmeline Spollen is the coordinator of Ukraine Ireland Civil Society Forum, which is a response initiative um, convened by civil society acting collectively to support the, the emergency settlement of Ukrainian refugees in Ireland. I'm going to do that weird thing of saying, and somebody who needs no introduction, but then go on and introduce them anyway. Uh, Frank Geary, director of uh, the Irish Development Education Association, which is uh, the national network for development education uh, in Ireland. Uh, thanks very much to the panelists for joining us today. Um, just building on um, Gillian's uh, amazing presentation, which I think really captured the kind of zeitgeist that all of our organizations currently find ourselves in. If you if you look at kind of current leadership and organizational theory, 
literature, it talks a lot about wicked problems, which are these kind of um, seemingly intractable and interconnected problems. And I think the war in Ukraine is the perfect example of that. You have conflict um, on the continent of Europe, which has ripple effects that result in increased levels of poverty in sub-Saharan Africa and is a major driver of food insecurity um, in East Africa. And th the whole kind of discourse around the world changing around us rather than us being um, drivers of change, I think really links that idea of wicked problems. And the literature goes on to say that the way you combat wicked problems is through a networked approach. So I think the kind of direction of travel that Gillian has outlined there and is, and is encouraging us um, to, to kind of go on this journey is, is really timely, uh, really important. And, and I think that our, uh, our panelists are going to have some really interesting reflections um, on, uh, on all of this. Um, we have a fair bit of time. We have uh, close to 50 minutes. So I think we're going to have a really good conversation and get into some Q&A afterwards. Um, turning to Emma and Martina initially, uh, because some of your work might be a bit new to, um, to our membership, could you give us a brief overview um, of, your, of your networks, um, how they evolved, how they came about, um, and the kind of direction of travel that you, you currently see um, for each of your organizations? Martina. Um, well, first of all, Scale Ireland was only set up relatively uh, late, I suppose, in, in 2019. So it's a new organization, and it's the independent, not-for-profit rep representative organization for Irish tech startups and scaling companies. And for those who are not familiar with the sector, and there are many, uh, basically, we represent uh, companies that are in medtech, fintech, enterprise solutions, clean tech, agri-tech, lots of tech. <laughs> There's a tech focused and they're export focused as well. And they're looking to sell their uh, tech solutions abroad from day one. And they have to invest an awful lot in their tech solutions from the get go. And they could be cash negative. So it's an unusual quarter, we'll say of the SME uh, sector, but you could have anyone who is starting off with a company who is um, developing their tech and their team and they're before they're registered uh, and out pre-vat reg before they're they're selling anything right up to what has become known as a tech unicorn in, in Ireland that are worth you know quite a, a large amount in employing hundreds and uh, we have them all around the country and just to to give you a, a kind of um, I suppose synopsis of our kind of members and what they're doing we have heard tech that deals with registering cattle to Food Cloud that deals with the tech solution on food wastage, to Siren that deals with security, uh, people trafficking, uh, drone or MANA, which deals with drone delivery, uh, so many in the enterprise solutions dealing with companies and helping solutions for them. And then there's also social impactful uh, startups, and I suppose Food Cloud would be in that, but Gabadoo that links clinical therapists to parents. So there's a very wide range of them, but tech is at their heart. And again, we were just set up in 2019, but we're very heavy on stakeholder engagement, members, corporate partners, uh, government, state agencies, other organizational, uh, sectoral, uh, not-for-profits and organizations. So there's a lot of work in our community just maintaining that network. And we also have corporate partners that keep the lights on, as well as our members. And we have the EU and global networks. I'm going to stop now. Emma. Um, Hmm. So um, the Ukraine Civil Society Forum is a group now of about 85 NGOs uh, in Ireland who back obviously when the war broke out, um, we had a humanitarian crisis on our doorstep here within Ireland with the refugee flows coming. You know, we would have had maybe two to three thousand a year in international protection and suddenly within a month we were at 20,000. So it was really very different and and, and it was um, how to respond. So we, um, you know, Ireland is full of international development organizations and reached out to say, what do you do in your in the Lebanon? What do you do in Sudan? Like, how do you, how do you, what, what is, what is good practice? Give us some guidance. Um, and with that, we uh, organized ourselves. Um, we organized clusters, so on, you know, gender-based violence and trafficking, accommodation, children, um, 
refugee information and all of those things just to try and pull together the, uh, I suppose, the expert organizations that are there in those spaces and then try to be connecting into the community response is one of the probably uh, the most important because that's the front line of where things are happening. And those organizations wouldn't necessarily be well networked uh, into a national space or across county or local authority boundaries. They would often be very networked locally. Um, and, and so we were, um, yeah, it, it was a pop-up. It didn't have large conversations. It had very little stakeholder consultation. It was, we need to do something hear something if you wish to join do and then people have and organizations have chosen to do so because we're offering I suppose three things um we were offering the the uh the information sharing you know we all needed to learn from each other there was a few expert organizations around refugee and migration but you know now we have refugees and migrants in all our communities so how do you get that information out we're all responding uh, to an immediate crisis uh, how do we share the knowledge uh, and 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 not be duplicating Certainly, we're all seeing similar things. How do we capture that data and use that to advocate with government so that we can say these are real problems? It's not just happening in Leash, it's happening in X, Y, and Z places. Um, how do we, how do, and then having that uh, space to actually create a dialogue with government to try and engage the different departments, try to get a better response, try to get uh, leadership, a plan, a communication, and a year on, we're still trying. Uh, and then how do we then also look around the goodwill and the narrative, right? Because again, the, the response in Ireland was extraordinary, but we really needed to be continue to be extraordinary because this is not a problem that's going away. And we still have 2000 people arriving in every, every every month and it just gets harder especially when you're in a housing crisis and you're in a cost of living crisis and so we uh, also set up a story lab to try and bring in the voices of Ukrainians and their own experience in Ireland and bring that through to the media both national and targeted in local and regional uh, spaces uh, so that uh, we can bring those voices there, people, keep people connected to the Ukraine as other things go up on the agenda. And so that's kind of uh, what we are doing. So we have one person working three days a week on the uh, communication side, and I work three days a week on this. And so everything else is very much done virtually uh, and through Slack. Okay, Thank, thanks very much. Um, Frank, IDEA, um, the network within a network, things are getting metaphysical, uh, no pressure. Um, your um, IDA has obviously been around a little bit longer, so it would be good to kind of get your reflections on on the kind of evolution of your network and how it's changed over time, what's driving those changes, and is it delivering better impact? Sure. Thanks very much, Fergal, and thanks to Jane Ann and Docus. It's really great to, to be here, and it's great to be here in person as well. Um, so IDEA, as many of you will know, because I know some of you and some of your organizations are members of IDEA, we're the Irish Development Education Association. So we're the national network for anybody who's involved in global citizenship education or education around sustainable development. We have 110 members. Uh, our members really straddle civil society and education. So we have international development NGOs. We also have community-based organizations here in Ireland, and we have those working within the education system as such. And they're working right across lifelong learning. So from early years, the whole way up through to adult education, taking in the youth sector, taking in all aspects of formal, non-formal and informal education. And in terms of that question about our evolution, um, IDEA in many ways was a community before it was a network. And I think that's a really, really important part of our identity and our, our DNA. So um, some of the people maybe in this room actually who came together, who were working on development education. Um, and in fact, some of the people maybe on this panel, I think Emma was involved as, um, as well. So um, uh, came together as a community working on development education and from that the network grew and uh, on the question about evolution that's absolutely crucial to us because it's crucial to how we work that sense of ownership and participation by our members is a really really important part of how we work structures have come in you know we have working groups we have other ways of working but we try in terms of as a staff team, we try and constantly reflect on that. How do we engage the members? How do we keep that active engagement in everything that we do? So in many ways, it's about an approach 
um, uh, and a mindset and a way of working. And we would encourage our members also to share that mindset and, and way of using their network. I think that um, I think what you touch on there is really interesting. The, the, the difference between a kind of a deliberate kind of planned approach and, and the organic growth out of a out of a community. Um, and I'm wondering if the, if the other panelists have some kind of reflections on that. Because I wonder if the if the Ukrainian response was more organic because we saw things popping up all, spontaneously all around the country, um, and whether you've kind of harnessed that organic um, kind of impetus and tried to kind of marshal that into something more networked. Yeah, I think yeah, it's a not, it's a um, it's a natural networking that has come out of uh, need. Right. Um, and so I think you only exist as a network when you're adding value. Uh, and and that's something you have to manage the whole time. But you certainly, yes, it was pop up. You couldn't get more organic in that sense. Um, and we the benefit of a crisis, I suppose, there's, there's something about when you can organize around something like a crisis, it's very, very helpful. And people have seen that when we've done referendums, if you can pull everyone together for a movement, it's got a three month, you've got, you know, you're, it's a sprint, you can hold everyone together. When you go to the marathon and you go to the longer and sustaining networks over longer periods, I think, well, you have to go through constant reinvention and you have to always make sure that you are adding value. And, and I suppose the network that you started, we started with a year ago, if we still exist, which we are always under review, whether we could close, um, would be will be quite different. Um, and we've had the conversations whether you know do we keep the Ukraine focus? Do we add all refugees? Do we add all migrants? You know what would would we be adding value or would we be taking space from others? How do we how do we actually um, deliver the most impact uh, on the whole refugee issue? And and for now, the Ukraine is the way in because you get in the door there. But that's not meaning that the equity and the need to have zero, you know, having equity within the system is absolutely paramount. So and when we talk about next stage, it could be about integration and, and, and how do you how does that look and how does that work? And is that our job or is that being handing back this or handing this network over to uh, somebody else or some other organization? So the key for us has been no ego mm. uh, and, and, the, and the focus is collaboration. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. A another issue that that's come up is is the diversity of of the networks. You you all have very diverse networks, um, and I think it, it came through in Gillian's presentation that maybe the DOCUS network is, is isn't hugely diverse. Like a lot of our organisations have you know have been around for quite a long time. We all do largely very similar work. Um, so I'm wondering if you could maybe Martina reflect on. Uh, you know the strength in diversity. It's 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 a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. Um, you know how how do you draw on that diversity? You know to to uh, to deliver on the impact that you're trying to have. Well, first, I could, you know, I'd like to say as a board member, you can see the power of having an established network here today. Uh, we didn't, when I joined in November uh, 2020, we didn't have a membership. Mm. So we were an organization that was set up just on the cusp of COVID. And all of that period, my predecessor was spending help helping startups. So we had to put a structure in place. It's quite the opposite of something. And of, of what Emma has said, we had to put a structure. We had to launch a membership model a fee paying membership model in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so that's not hard. Um, so we, we also, and startups, there's a high attrition rate in startups, many don't succeed. Mm -hmm. And now we all know about those great stories, but there's many small startups, there's scaling startups, there's you know, and ones that are global. And um, so we had to you know, do a body of work and we had a Slack channel and that had 300 people. And it's because one member of our team, and I think there was three people on the team with various hours when I was full time. And that person had just simply had a, a you know, was interested in Slack. So out of Slack, um, a membership model that we grew out of a working group with founders, uh, without social media, we had a couple of hundred, I think we had 700 on our social media. We now have, you know, five and a half thousand. We also, through our newsletters, it was that basic, but we had to hammer the messaging and really clone in what did our community want. And we built a community that today and next week we're on our third year drive, we now have 700 members. And I'm very proud of that because it was during a pandemic in a community that has a wide and diverse membership and that some startups, a lot of startups are pre-vet reg, they're, they're starting off, but there's also, of course, those great success stories. So 
uh, we had to start that structure. So be very grateful for the structure you have in DOCUS. But I'm also very proud of what we've built. And I think there's a great pride of what we've done and what we've done to engage that membership and to let it you know, grow year on year growth. And our corporate partners are growing and, and that. But that is not by accident. I think everyone in every organization here knows the amount of time and effort and resources you need to grow or just to keep the status quo. Yeah. You know, and that, that is difficult, but it is a very diverse grouping and to engage all elements of it. Yeah. And it's probably not a surprise that that a startup network are, are using Slack. Um it's it's it seems hugely appropriate. And and I'd be interested in in going exploring that a little bit more, the kind of practical tools and platforms that can be used to drive networking and to dr drive collaboration. Uh, and obviously it has to be appropriate. Slack for startups makes sense. Um Emma, any, any particular kind of tools or approaches or platforms um, that have worked for your members? We're using Slack and Zoom. Oh, Slack yeah. and Zoom. Okay, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I'd used Slack before and something and ne it never took off. You know, I didn't get it. Um, and, and then uh, with this, we needed something which would have more discipline than a whatsapp group you know i didn't want 10 million whatsapp groups um i needed to know who was on it we need to know where the conversations are going we need to be able to people to self-organize because we only had a very small office so it, it wasn't um possible you know that way so it for me the slack was enabled enabling us to get a, whatever conversations people needed to get off they could go people self um moderate in many ways they 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 connect with each other, direct messaging or whatever. So there's only so much connecting that I have to do, which is very, very helpful. And the other side of it is it's that you have the, the conversation is there and the documents are there and the answers are there. So when, so one of the feedbacks we've had from organizations is they found it really useful when they've had a turnover in staff and the staff member changes, um, they just say, go on the Slack, you'll see it all there, you know, and if there's any questions, come back to me. And so you don't lose the knowledge that often gets shared in emails and in WhatsApp groups. And for the uninitiated, um, uh, 30 second description of Slack. <laughs> it's just a, it's just a, it's just an app on my phone, you know what I mean? And it has a list of, you know, I go employment, accommodation, welfare, you know, you could do HIV, AIDS, child protection, you know, that kind of way. And then the people who are interested join in those groups and you don't have to be in any of them. You choose which ones you want to and you choose to get notifications and you just post a question or share a resource um, are you see who's also in that and you connect with them. And so things that have come out of that for us has been the sometimes the connections that happen then offline in terms of shared collaborations on pieces of work. Um, but I suppose one example which has been really helpful for us is, you know, the state hasn't set up a any monitoring of quality of accommodation. There's now 980 contracts for accommodation out there. There's no quality. There's no HICWA inspections. There's absolutely, we don't even know if organizations are connected to them. So we have had to do a grassroots connecting community organizations with accommodation centers and asking them to be the eyes and ears on the ground, asking them to uh, share if there are any incidents. So we now have an NGO, Doris and Limber, who is connecting all these organizations up and say and we're sharing those incidents and then we're able to then send a report every week to the department to say these are the issues we need you to inspect these hotels we really need x y and z to happen and that is being happening because of the self-organizing slack is just part of it but that allows us to give a i suppose an insight and a transparency mm -hmm. into all of that that's happening and let others also join into it when they see that there's momentum and happening there martini you want to come in there and I would say that Slack, and, and many people will have Slack already, lots of organizations have Slack channels and, and Slack um, communities. So you're competing against those sometimes that everybody has got yours open at, at a period. And also it's time that everybody is checking their Slack every day. So there's no silver bullet Slack alone. Like we have hold Ask Me and things on Slack as long as our, ch as well as our channels. And we actually did a, an analysis of our Slack community and a lot of indirect messaging is the most popular form our team. Mm. It works really well for working groups. Um, but on others, it can be the quiet networking that's done there. But we actually host Ask Me Anythings on it. And they're written Ask Me Anythings. Because let's be honest, we have a thousand people on our Ask Me Anything channel. And you can only get in now if you're a member. <laughs> and you can... Um, on that Ask Me Anything for, for 30 minutes, you can ask an expert any question. 
okay, there could be 10 people on that channel, but by the next day and the next and that week, all that thousand will have read that. And we all actually use it, complement the traditional communication mm -hmm. uh, forms like newsletters to send out, you know, a link to those Slack uh, conversations and gather them into graphics so people can see, okay, that marketing expert, that investor expert, this is what they had to say. And you have it also on the member page. So Slack alone, mm -hmm. and I think everybody's going to realize that is not, you know, the silver bullet. It's a complementary complementing everything, the traditional and the new, and constantly trying to make it engage with members, which I think everyone here will know is so important because we're at the moment introducing on a trial basis an introduction uh, system within Slack that people are connected through this system, through this tech solution. And we'll see if it works, but we're also prepared that we may have to try something else. So it, it, it continues, you're never finished. Frank. Yeah, and I think I'd, I'd add to that. So we've had um, mixed experience with Slack. Um, it's worked really well where it's been around a particular event or particular activity. It's worked really, really well, you know, particularly when during the last few years where we had to move key things like conferences and other events online, the Slack then created essentially the space that you have in this room for people to engage with one another. What we found much more challenging with Slack is to continue it in an ongoing way. But I think that kind of speaks to Martina's point and, and, and the point that was raised earlier around the need to be constantly evolving, that there is no one size fits all. And particularly at the moment where we're, I mean, like I said, it's great to be here in the room, that the, the face to face is so important and it's great to be back in a situation like that. But it's so different from how it was, you know, pre pre, you know, 2020, um, where everything we did by and large was based on face to face. Now we're using a mix of we'll do some events in person, we'll do some hybrid events, we'll do some things that are online, we'll try and communicate with people in other ways. And I think this is the invitation that the um the the docus, you know, the map we've just seen from Gillian. And, and this impact network approach is really important because I think it's saying, here's your space um, and it's for you to engage with it and you to design it for the purposes that you you need. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I've spent uh, a lot of my career in a very operational environment, which is very heavy on coordination for a uh, uh, you have UN-led coordination for uh, and you have NGO-led coordination for a uh, government-led coordination for a uh, and in the NGO sector, we are uh, quite well adept at uh, disparaging those uh, those um, networking and coordination efforts. And I'd always be that one kind of awkward person to say, uh, you know, someone might say, oh, the UN cluster system doesn't work. And I say, well, actually, you are the UN cluster system. And, you know, are you participating fully? And are you sending the right person to the meetings? Uh, and I'd used to make lots of friends uh, uh, with those with those points. Um, but I, I think I think that's really important for any for any network, any member membership based network that the members are going to get out of the network what they put into it. And there's only so much that the leads or the secretariats of those networks um, can do and would be really interested to get your kind of reflections on, you know, what you know, what you know, what you get, what you get out is what you put in. Any reflections on that? Any panelist? Well, we have two working groups at the moment and due to capacity, and I'm looking down at uh, Jane Ann smiling because she has a plethora of them, but we have strategically um, established two because it, to grow that takes a lot of time and you want them to be meaningful. There's no point in having an array of working groups if they're not working and people, they're walking away, you lose people, you lose members and you lose engagement and you lose cred. So we have one on sustainability that has worked really um cleverly and we brought key people in and the members vet the next members of it. It's a small group, but it's really a powerful group. And also we have a student entrepreneurship group from all around the country and they engage and this is a bad time for them because of exams, but it does work very well. And also that they're part of our events. But I would say that one of the things that we try to do is bring everyone together under one roof. We're not an events organization. And I should say we're 100% commercial. We may get sponsored, but we are different to many people in this room that we don't get direct government funding. So it really is important how we engage with our members as it is for those who do to keep that link with mm -hmm. direct government funding. Um, but in relation to what we found is powerful, that we hold uh, some events during the year and they're we bring everyone together, all those strategic 
partners are members. It's first come, first serve to get a ticket to this, our regional startup summit, our corporate partners, uh, key state agencies, and we have our members in the audience and also on the platform. So we will have uh, on the stage, so we will have, for instance, three startups, very different, mm -hmm. very different stages, very different styles, talking about their innovations, their plans, their ambitions, and also their problems. And facing them, we'll have a keynote and also an address from a key minister. And we've had the Taoiseach, two different Taoiseach uh, launch our regional startup summit that only started off last year. And we've had again this year in Cork and, and, and Galway. And then we've had our, our autumn gathering and we had the Minister of Finance, the only event he did before the budget. Okay. And the, the power of that is that we're engaging our community, they're networking, they're talking just like in this room, but they're also hearing from a key stakeholder in that. And also, I think from the political perspective, they're hearing from their, these startups that they may not meet in their day to day or spend time. And they're hearing about their plans, they're hearing what they're doing, and then they're also hearing they're challenging. And it's, I suppose, a constructive way to engage with them. And we have found that powerful, as well as it being a networking and also a collaborative piece that everybody can meet. The community comes together under that roof. But we're not events. We don't have the logistics to do several events. But what we do, we try to do well. Okay. Be great. Yeah, Frank. I, I think a really key thing on that that question about kind of what you what you get is what you put in is being close to the ethos of what you're about. So for us as an organization that is focused on development education, on global citizenship education, the idea of participation, the idea of participatory learning is absolutely at the heart of what we do. So if we can thread that and build that into um, whatever we organize as, a, as the staff team within the network, but also whatever comes from our membership, whether that's through working groups, whether it's through just the informal as well as the formal conversations, you know, that, that informal is incredibly useful where, you know, there are ideas talked about in a room like this, and then we think, well, maybe we can do such and such around, around that. But that staying close to the ethos, that emphasis, you know, on participation, on learning together is a really, really important part of it. And again, I think in the context here of the, the DOCUS conference, you know, the, the next session is going to be looking at locally led development. You know, the, over, uh, you know, in Gillian's presentation, it struck me thinking back about the Rios pro pro process, for example. There are really crucial questions that are being raised there, which are about our structures, which are about the way that we work, the way that we organize our work. So to use this opportunity, I think, is really, really important. Um, and to use the space here in, in DOCUS as, as our network to explore those questions, I think, is really, really important. And I suppose the one thing that I uh, would reflect on is because we've been able to organize virtually and through social media platform, there's no cost or barrier for someone in Wexford or Kerry or Sligo. And so, and they don't have to be big organizations. They can be, don't even have to be an organization if they're, you know, they're committed to what they're doing. So we've been able to connect people in and have them have the national access that they couldn't have normally and they wouldn't have had before we had these 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 devices and and that adds value to them and they get the you know now we're all fighting the far right they're getting the messaging the, the media and how they work it and they're getting access to government that they wouldn't necessarily do themselves or their organization might not want to do advocacy but then also our organizations who are maybe a little bit more resourced none of them are very well resourced in this sector and um, they're getting the benefit of hearing firsthand the frontline caseworkers and the frontline ukrainian caseworkers uh, experience of the issues that are coming forward in real time and there, there's there's nothing better than hearing it directly from the horse's mouth and reading it on a paper or a report you know it just brings it alive and i think it makes so, so what I'm seeing is there's huge added value from the larger organizations who work on a national stage anyway, who have access to government, uh, and but none of them have media people. Mm. Uh, and then the smaller organizations are the more much more local, further from Dublin uh, organizations who uh, now have a voice that's being heard much more in the first in, for, first hand. Okay. Thanks very much. So in, in the interest of... Um getting out what you put in we're, we're going to open it up for uh, for questions now um we have uh, about 20 about 25 minutes left and um, so please do make your voice heard be the change you want to see 
you know what? Yeah, go ahead. So thanks so much. That's fascinating. And I think really exciting. I mean, it's an exciting opportunity. And I think it speaks to the strategic vision from, from uh, those to, you know, be much more agile in the way that they connect with So, so you know, it's a really great time. Um, I suppose I have a couple of questions. One maybe is for, for those themselves. I mean, there's a long list of things you use. But just for thought about, you know, where does it start or, or how do you start? And is it driven by members or is it you have a vision of, you know, how you go from that list? If you heard from Hamlet that really is around one or two areas that greatest uh, utility comes from. So just your thoughts on that, Gillian. And maybe just a comment from the panelists about, you know, what advice do you have for DOCUS? Uh, should uh, DOCUS steer this in some way? Or is it really, I mean, you've heard a lot about it coming from it has to come from me, it has to be useful. So should it be really intended to come from the from the members? Should we drive um, how they use this fantastic new tool that we have? Thanks, Nona. Gillian, do you want to? Uh, well, maybe I'll just start on, well, two things in, in addressing your question, where do we go from here? Uh, I think the first thing to say is, obviously, it, this is a tool for use by the members, so we have to be informed by the members. We, ha we do have some, I hope, good ideas internally on where we can go from here with it, and they most of them do fall under, you know, certainly, the, the first two um, potential uses one would be sectoral planning and analysis and the other would be well actually three campaign mobilization and also organizational well it's up to individual organizations to to some extent to, to how they want to use it internally um so we have some ideas around that we also have we've we've started playing out with some scenarios for example if we were to look in retrospect at say an example would be a response to the Horn of Africa crisis. How, if we had had this tool at the time, how would we have used it? And how could we look at the individual maps to tell us X, Y, and Z in order to inform how we might mobilize in terms of a campaign? So that's one, I think, concrete example. But there are a few of them. We also have been looking at it, say, in relation to some of the advocacy areas. One of them might be um, and thematics. One of them might be climate and a couple of specific areas around climate. Um, but on a practical level, where we'll go from here, I would like to engage with people, with, with organizations individually, for those who are hopefully interested over the next couple of months, uh, to find out where you see us going with it, how you might like to input to it, um, you know, issues around data, because there are some, we will recognize that there are some issues around data. Um, so to be informed by you, but also to bring our own ideas to you on where we can go from here. Um, did you want to come in there now? Yeah, just to add, um, add to Gillian, uh, what Gillian said there, I think a lot of um, some of the vision behind this is trying to figure out how we have the right forum to fit the objective. And I think there's a lot there. And <laughs> I think sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming. Where do we go next? But I think it's really around probably the next step. And I hope Gillian will get to this when, you know, meeting with your individual organizations is kind of saying, OK, when we look at some of the thematics that are emerging, like what what does that look like in reality? Is it a long term vision that you have that you want to work with others on? Or is it a case that, you know, uh, you want to ensure that we get together as a sector before COP every year? You know, is, is it long term you want to work on climate finance or is it more to do with a different objective? And I think for me, what's driving a little bit of this is that at the moment we work in quite, I would say, uh, exclusive way. Uh, you're either part of a working group or you're not. If you're not part of it, you don't necessarily, you're not privy to the information. You're not necessarily... Uh, you don't necessarily know when things are happening. Um, and actually, that excludes not only people that are, you know, outside Ireland, um, but also it excludes a lot of our smaller members who don't have the time to be part of all of our working groups. So it's really thinking a bit bigger, not only in terms of what we do, but how we do it. Yeah, yeah thanks very much. Panelists, um, there was also a question put to you there from Fanola. Um, where does the impetus, impetus come from? Is it bottom up or is it, or is it top down or is it not that simple? 
you know the usual answer it's both <laughs> um to me a network is you know you have a clear mission you provide tools you facilitate uh and and there's there's a, a lot of effort that goes into facilitating you know what i mean to make something like this work and making connections i think is a huge part when you're in a network uh both internally and uh, bringing access to government and, and and others um but ultimately it only succeeds if if the members are engaged um which means it needs to be adding something to their day uh or to their career or to their network you know so i mean and i suppose you don't have to be hitting one thing um it, it can be it's how does it add value and do i enjoy it or am i meeting people that actually i'm learning from or that you know you and because you all work together and you probably all work in different organizations in your lifetime it's a career opportunity to be you know connecting with each other so yeah um, and i think um and I, you probably say i would say it but communication is clear i think if if those who are, you know, donors or supporters or members know from the get go uh, the level of communication, what the expectation is, that's fair enough. I think if you over promise and don't deliver, then there is a problem. So I think you have to be honest with them. And I think most people recognize that not for profits can't do everything all the time um, and they're not big organizations. So I think you do have to have honesty about it. I do think that's an excellent resource, Jane Ann and, and to Gillian. The, the mapping that can be used for key strategic um, presentations to government departments and internationally and to members of courts. It's such a great and fantastic um, initiative. And I just want to congratulate you on it because it is super, the information that's contained there. And um, so when I started an idea, I got some advice from Hans Zomer, who was then the director of DOCUS. So I'm, I'm, I'm at risk of taking advice from DOCUS and bringing it back to DOCUS here. <laughs> But Hans said to me, he said, look, there's two things that a network does. There's one is about responding to the needs of members and the other is about providing sectoral leadership that those of us who are in networks are fortunate. We have a bird's eye view of the entire context that no one member organization can have. So in terms of that question, I think it's really about combining both of those. It's that combination of, of responsiveness and need and also um, look scanning the horizon and, and seeing more broadly. And I think in terms of then the other thing I'd say, and this is a real learning from development education, is the importance of facilitation that, you know, we know inherently in the work of development education that learning spaces don't just happen. They require that facilitation. They, they require that, that care, um, which again is a net, something that I think a network like DOCUS really does and that a project like this can really, those individual meetings you spoke about, Gillian, you know, those are such a crucial part of, of all of that. I knew Frank would bring the metaphysical in the end. Uh, at the back there, Hi, uh, Anita Friel is my name. I'm with Goal. Uh, I uh, I'm going to actually challenge you and turn this, you know, the the, the way around. And I say this uh, with being, you know, we've heard here the benefits of uh, you know, being part of a network, absolutely. And I've seen that over, you know, the twenty plus, you know, years of that of, I've worked in the sector. And I and again, I say this as a very good DOCA citizen. I believe absolutely in the value of DOCA. That's why I'm here, you know, today. But I mean, having said that, over time, I've also realized that there are disadvantages as being part of a bigger network. You know, and there is that proverb, you know, if you want to go fast, you go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. And, you know, we work in, you know, very, you know, extreme humanitarian situation where if you, you know, were to kind of collaborate and consult, well, then, you know, the emergency has moved on and lives have been lost, you know, et cetera. So I'd like to uh, sort of some reflection, you know, from the panel uh, members on the, as I said, the disadvantage of, of, of working together, working in networks and maybe the advantages of going it alone sometimes. And I'm I'm thinking now, for example, of you, Martina, even if you could reflect on your personal experience. I mean, you were a journalist you know, and chasing that story on your own and, you know, writing that book, incredible, you know, which all we, I hope all of us have read, you know, Madame President, and now trying to push, you know, the network, you know, this huge number of organizations, you know, what are the disadvantages and how much can you achieve on your own and how much can you achieve on, on as I said, you know, with others. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and 
To be honest, and, and it's an interesting because people ask me, first of all, I, the most question I'm most going to get most of is, do you miss journalism? And the question the answer is always very quick, no. <laughs> and people are very surprised how quickly I say that. I had, we had a great privilege of being a journalist, a national journalist and a political uh, correspondent with RT, and I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the buzz of getting a story. I, w I hoovered everything, to be honest. And I could, I used to almost announce the budget, you know, the day before, you know, um, and people thought, oh, someone hands you it. No, that's about 20, 30 phone calls and checking and rechecking. Um, but I loved my period in that. But you were constantly engaging with people and building trust and credibility. And if that sounds familiar, it's exactly the same in, in, in what I do now, but you are responsible for an organization. So yes, you might have been building all those relationships. You're still working with a team and a newsroom and editors and cameramen, which you don't see on air. And likewise, you're, you're, you're now got your team and you're trying to build them up and keep them um, and also motivate them and energize them and also give back and recognize them. And I will say today has been a very good example of that because I always think you you get a good sense of an organization. We're not just name checking, but it gives back to those who, who've got them on stage here because it's never just one person on stage. It's the, the people around. So in terms of I was never really solo, but I was in building my context. But, it, you know, st strategic stakeholder engagement is the exact same at a higher level. Now it's CEOs, it's still stakeholders in government and state agencies, and it's membership. But I think if you underpinning, no matter what role you are, the values. And like sometimes some I was trying to get, um, and actually it is for this area, a lovely startup for our Department of Finance. A autumn gathering and it measured satellite data on crops in Africa and it was such a great startup and great idea and unfortunately it didn't do well it went to the wall but I still gave them a ticket although they couldn't afford the membership or get in at that time and I think it's the values you have that builds the network as well that you don't forget people and be transactional either you both have to to do it so I don't really see I do see a change in pressure in a different way timelines and, and social media and not so much but also you have people under you that you have to mind and also keep that community yep thanks very much disadvantages anyone else want to sorry anyone else want to come in there I, I mean i think you know as you said anita that you know pace is definitely um you know that the pace of what you can do within a network compared with what you can do as a as a, an organization is by its very nature different. Um, but I also think, I mean, I increasingly find myself thinking of the metaphor of a, a, a an ecosystem when we come to networks and when we come to working together. But fundamentally, we are made up of, you know, a range of different organizations, individuals, actors, who all have their own specialisms and their own specialist function, essentially. And that when we come together, we have that, you know, huge additional impact. And I think, I, I know I'm answering your question with an advantage rather than a disadvantage. I can't help it. Um, but I just, I think that, that there's, so the, the tension and the dynamic is there where you have sometimes those, those individual organizations don't come together. You know, I know that, you know, in many of the debates here in DOCUS, that's the case around certain issues, but there are always areas where we can come together. So I think, that um, tension between advantage and disadvantage is actually a really productive part of, of working in a network. I, um, I might just say, I'm trying not to speak too much today, <laughs> uh, but I might just say, I, I don't see it as an either or. And I think it's, uh, you know, um, if you are, I think fundamentally within all of our members, there's some core issues, which I think we all agree with, you know, uh, and that we all want to advocate on or we all want to lobby on. And I think it's what I would like to see is that, you know, um, at that highest level, we can come together in a kind of a purposeful way and agree that lines, but actually also have the flexibility and the space for organizations to have their own messages, their own dialogue. And I think the, the Horn of Africa last year was one example where I think we, we tried to do that, where, OK, this is an issue for all of us. We are all shouting that this is unacceptable what's happening. But actually, you know, we are um, each individual organization then within DOCUS has their own narrative has what they are want to push out what the, and it's not up to us to control that but it's us to amplify the broader issue and come together 
to amplify it, yeah. Uh, time's marching on. Um, I think we probably have time for a couple more questions. Rosmond, at the back. Thank you. I'm quite loud as it is. Um, yes, how do we bring more diversity? How do we connect, get more people to connect with us from the Global South um, through these collaborations and networks? Yeah. You, you, you probably have some good thoughts on diversity and power differentials and um, different kinds of organizations, some who might need to have their voices amplified. Well, I suppose, I think there's no more democratization mm. than a Zoom screen. You're all equally, mm. you know, in your same shape box and, you know, the you know, the distance is not there. Yes, you may be sometimes language, uh, which we obviously, we are only dealing with Ukrainian and English, uh, but, you know, it's, um, th that's the piece that I've just been really struck by is that the accessibility, the barriers to to being in, around the table, the, bar the barriers to being in the room are now gone. It, when we, if we try to bring back it in Dublin meetings, then you begin to exclude people who can't come and travel. Um, so because, you know, we're not trying to exist forever. We're not trying to create a network that's going to be here in 10 years time at all. Um, what we want to do is to respond and be gone. But what the legacy will be will be the connections between people, right? The relationships are being built and that's what will be the, the legacy. And so I suppose the thing that we have been very lucky is there's no ego in the room. We were stepping into a vacuum that nobody owned. It wasn't someone else's space. So so we were answering, uh, we were an answer and different answers for different people. And that's why I think we've been lucky and some will be quite different to maybe other networks who were established mm -hmm. you know, to, to exist forever. But I do think the 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 strength and the added value is the ability to have people connected in who couldn't be here otherwise, and there that, that and and we get an awful lot out of it. Maybe one last question. No. Uh, okay then. Um, just to just to wrap up, um, you know, I think some really clear themes, you know, emerged today. Um, one thing that I'm going to take away is the importance of the network delegate. I think, you know, for, for each one of our organizations, it's clear that they're going to play a really key role in moving this project forward. So I'm I, I'm definitely going to take away, you know, making sure that we have the right net, network delegate and they are equipped and empowered um, to represent us in this uh, really uh, exciting um, venture. Um, I think, you know, inevitably with all these kinds of things, there's the, there's the kind of hard technical side. You know, we talked about Slack channels and and Zoom and working groups and, and you know, structures and, and things like that. But the softer side for me really came through. Uh, we talked about getting the ethos right. Uh, we talked about ownership. Uh, we talked about values. And I think, I think that's going to be key for us and you know we should be able to lean into that we're all pretty mission driven values driven people and um, but it's only going to come about through through really you know engagement um from from all of our organizations um and uh, and I know that Gillian has committed um to uh, to contact um, all of our organizations um and this is just the first step um on a on a long journey um but I think it's a really exciting kind of direction of travel um uh, for Docus, and I'm definitely, I'm definitely bought in anyway. Um, so just with that, I'll just thank uh, each one of the the panelists, um, Frank, Martina, uh, and Emma. I think their um, contributions were really uh, insightful. Um, and uh, thanks for your time today. <laughs>